Hey, we're here again, aren't we? Um, let's dive right into it because I got some stuff I want to talk about today. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at those petty cash problems that I assigned um, for homework. And I believe the first one that we did was quick study. Help me out, folks. Quick study 8.4. Okay. Let's do quick study 8.4. Okay. Um, all right, quick study 8.4. Again, we use petty cash for smaller disbursements so we don't have to go the whole, through the whole voucher approvement uh, process. Quick study 8.4. The petty cash fund of the Rio agency is established at $75. At the end of the current period, the fund contained $14 and had the following receipts. Film rentals, $19. Refreshments for meetings, $23. Both of those will be an entertainment expense. Posted, $6. And printing, $13. Prepare the journal entry to record the establishment of the fund and also the reimbursement at the end of the current period. Okay? And then they ask us another question, which we'll address shortly. Okay? So, what we do here is when we establish the fund, we simply debit petty cash and credit cash for $75. Correct? Oops, let me back that up for you so you can all see it. Can you see it now? Okay. Debit, petty cash, credit cash for $75. Okay, now it's time to reimburse it. Let's do those three steps like I told you. Okay, the first step is we ask ourselves how much cash is in that box right now? $14. And we want there to be 75, right? So how much more cash do we have to put in there? 61. So we credit cash for 61, not petty cash. We credit cash for $61, okay? All right, that's the first step. The next step is we go through and just envision yourself going through these receipts and we're gonna record them in the books, okay? Um, we have entertainment expense. I'll abbreviate a little bit entertainment expense for $42 for those two. Uh, we have postage expense for six. We have printing expense for 13. Now we're done recording those, right? The third step is to ask ourselves, does that journal entry balance? Does it balance? Okay, good. Balances. All right? So we don't have to debit or credit cash over and short, do we? Go through these steps, though, and do them in the order that I told you. I think you'll save yourself some, uh, some errors. All right, the other thing it asks is, when do we... Um, when do we, what would be the two events that caught a, cause a petty cash account to be credited in a journal entry? To be credited, the account petty cash. Now looking back at the Elmo, we did not credit it to replenish it, did we? We credited cash. So the two events are if we reduce the amount in our petty cash fund, we decide we don't want to keep $75 in there, maybe just $50, or we get rid of the petty cash fund altogether. Okay, so that the second the second situation is just kind of if you reduce it clear to zero. So mainly it's just if you reduce the fund, get rid of it or reduce it to a lesser amount in the petty cash box. Okay, make sense? Okay, let's jump over then to eight. Let's do eight six exercise eight six. All right, exercise eight six. Net Perks Company establishes a 200 petty cash fund on January 1. On January 8, the fund shows $28 in cash along with receipts for the following expenditures. Postage, $64. Transportation in, $19. Delivery expense, $36. And miscellaneous expense, $53. They use the perpetual inventory system in accounting for merchandise. Uh, prepare journal entries to establish the fund. Number two, to reimburse it. And three, to both reimburse the fund and increase it to $500 on January 8th. 
assuming no entry in part two. And it says, hint, make two separate journal entries for part three. Okay, well, let's do that real quick. All right. Um, okay, to establish the petty cash fund, to establish the petty cash fund for, for am I the right one? Nope. Sorry. To establish the petty cash fund, we debit petty cash and credit cash for $200, right? Okay. Now, I'm not going to work through this next one. I'm going to work through 8-5 using the three steps. But if you work through these steps uh, on exercise 8-6 to replenish the fund, that is your journal entry, right? Okay. Now, here's the, here's the kind of the tricky thing that they did. Um, remember, if you pay for transportation, in a, in a, think back to chapter 5. If you pay transportation on merchandise inventory, remember how we debit merchandise inventory itself? Some of you might have uh, debited transportation and expense or delivery expense. You see what I'm saying? No, well, I, I probably wouldn't ask that on a test. I don't like to ask ask it in that manner, but that one might have tricked you a little bit. But we do debit merchandise inventory. Do you remember that from chapter five? So that is the journal entry to replenish it. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, and then what was the third thing they asked? What if we reimburse and increase it to 500? Well, if you reimburse it, it's going to be the same journal entry, right? Okay. That's to reimburse it. And what did we originally establish this for? Well, how much? 200. And now we're going to increase it to what? 500. So we just need to debit petty cash for 300 and credit cash for 300. Now, if you, you could combine these two entries, but I would advise you to not do it. I think you'll confuse yourself. Okay, if you if you combined them on a test and it was a you know, and everything netted out so it was the same regardless of if you did it in two entries or one entry, then that would be okay. But I really would advise you to just do this in two separate entries. I think it's less confusing. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on exercise eight six? Any questions? Okay, let's take a look at exercise 8.5. I'm going to move through this one a little bit more slow. Exercise 8.5. Hawk Company establishes a $400 petty cash fund on September 9th. On September 30, the fund shows $166 in cash along with receipts for the following expenditures. Transportation N, $32. Postage expense, $113. Miscellaneous ex expense, $87. The petty cashier could not account for $2 shortage in the fund. Hawk uses the perpetual system in accounting for merchandise inventory. They want us to prepare the sep September 9th entry to establish the fund, the September 30 entry to re reimburse the fund, and an October 1 entry to decrease the fund to $300. Okay? All right. So let's take a look at this. All right. So. To establish the petty cash fund, we're going to debit petty cash and credit cash for how much? Oops, thank you. $400? All right. So that's to establish the fund. Now let's work real carefully through. Uh, the steps, the three steps I taught you in regards to replenishing a fund. And I'll, I will tell you, I've been doing this many, many years, and if I don't do these steps in this order, I always end up making a mistake. Okay? It seems very easy, and it might be the, uh, it might be the inclination to do your debits first and then your credits. Well, I want you to eventually list them that way, but I urge you to prepare that, this journal entry to replenish it using the steps in the order that I teach you. 
Okay? Now, the first step is this. How much did we set up the fund for? $200. When we open that box, how much cash is in there? Oh, thank you. Come on, Krug. Let me back up. When we established this fund, we established the fund for $400. For $400. When we open up that box, how much cash is sitting in there? 166 Is that right? Why doesn't that seem right? No, that wrong. That's right. That's right. That's right. Is it right? Because you'd have the $2 because they're short. You have to do the cash over. Yeah, hold on one second. Something doesn't seem right. Something doesn't seem right. Okay, I know why it doesn't seem right. I was looking at the wrong one. Okay, let's get this completely back up. Be patient with Grandpa, okay? I just got a haircut. Maybe they stuck the scissors too far into my head. Let's back completely up. We established this petty cash fund for $400, right? We open up the box, and you are right. How much cash is in there? 166. There's 166 in there. So how much more cash do we have to put in that box right now to bring it back up to $400? 234. 234, okay. So we credit cash for 234. That's our first step, okay? Now our second step is envision yourself going through those receipts and we're going to record this stuff in the books. Now we had transportation in again, didn't we? Right? So where does that go? We learned from the last time. Merchandise inventory, and I believe that was $32, okay? And then we had some postage expense, right? How much postage expense did we have? 113 okay. Uh, then we had something else too, didn't we? Miscellaneous expense for $87. So this is the second step, doing these, right? First step, second step, right? Now, the third step is to ask ourselves, does that journal entry balance? Does it balance? No. Which side needs help? The debit side needs $2. Of course, you're not going to put minus 2 here or something crazy like that. There's never a minus sign in a journal entry. But that needs $2 for, that, for the debits to equal the credits, right? And so what are we going to debit? Cash over and short. Now they told us that there was a $2 cash shortage there, right? But I want you to understand they really didn't need to tell us that. Okay, they really did not need to tell us that. We could have ascertained that by simply doing that third step and saying, does this journal entry balance? All right? But if you do this journal entry in those steps, I think you'll, you, you'll be fine. If you try to do your debits first, it gets really confusing. Okay? Now, then they said, okay, what if we increase the fund to, or I'm sorry, decrease the fund to $300? It was at $400, right? So what we would do here for this third entry would be to decrease petty cash by 100, we'd put that $100 back in the checking accounts or whatever, okay? Is that what y'all got? Okay, sorry for the confusion on that. Any questions on those? Yeah. Um, you come out and you are over two dollars. You just put the two on the credit side. Well, yeah, it's going to work. Look back at that. If you do these steps, then you'll say, okay, to balance the journal entry, there needs to be two dollars on the credit side. Okay. Okay. That's why this works beautifully to do these steps that way, because yeah. it will figure out for you if you have a cash overage or a cash shortage. 
Remember that cash over and short is an income statement account. Okay? If it has a net debit balance, it's going to be an expense. If it has a net credit balance, it will be a revenue. And as long as that account is not that big, you're probably not going to get all worked up about it. I'm probably not even going to worry about $2. Okay? That goes back to the cost benefit analysis on uh, internal controls, right? Now, nobody here has ever worked at a bank, right? I talk to my students who work at banks, and they, they do a cash drawer count at the end of each shift. Now, they, they pride themselves on coming out to the penny. Now, if a teller who is, who is hardly ever off is off by five bucks or so, they're probably not going to worry about it too much. Now, if, if he or she is off by five, six, seven dollars every day, they're probably not going to be employed long. And if they're off by a large amount, they're going to go through the records or whatever they have to and try to figure out what happened. Okay? So they, they do this sort of analysis at the end of each of their shifts. Okay? I think that's it for the homework, is it not? All right, great. Let's go back to the uh, PowerPoints. And I want to talk a little bit about bank activities as controls. Now this chapter is on internal controls and having a structure in here to try to uh, protect our assets, uh, you know, and uh, ensure reliable accounting, those sort of things. Well, our bank can be our friend as far as having procedures in place. There's things that they do that can help us uh, protect our assets. If we use these tools, it's like anything else. If we don't, if we decide to uh, not use them, then they won't be much help. Okay. Um, how many here have a checking account? Most of you, I see you with your hands up. Okay. How many of you use a debit card? How many people write checks? Okay. All of pretty much everybody. Okay. Well, when you opened up that checking account, one thing you did was probably do a signature card, and you signed your name, and so they know what your signature looks like, and they keep that in their file. So that is a control that they have. But these different things that they have: deposit tickets, checks. Um, bank statements. These act as controls. These are uh, documents, source documents, that help us monitor if the cash movement in our account is actually valid movement that we that we uh, that we wanted. Okay. Now let's come off of that. Uh, uh, come off the PowerPoint for a second. Okay. How many people? What we're going to learn about today is a bank reconciliation. What we're going to learn about today is a bank reconciliation. What is a bank reconciliation? Well, I'll tell you. Well, when you look at, your, at a certain date, like the end of the month, going, let's go to the PowerPoint. When you get a bank statement at the end of the month, the balance that it states that you have versus the balance that your books say you have or your or your running checking balance, those are going to be different, right? Correct? Now, why are those different? Okay, well, we're going to learn about why that those are different, but what we're going to do, coming off the PowerPoint, is we're going to do a reconciliation to try to figure out why those amounts are different, and we're going to hopefully do what we call reconciling our bank account. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Have you heard about this? How many people do a formal bank reconciliation of their account? I do. I do. Okay. Nobody else does? Now, I have some students say the following. Well, I don't do a bank reconciliation, but what I do is I look online, make sure things look kind of good, make sure things look all right. Well, let me tell you, folks, that's not a bank reconciliation. And um, there's a lot of things that you you're not going to catch by just perusing your activity. Okay? Now when you do that, when you just peruse your online activity and you're looking for um, looking, you're looking for weird things, aren't you? Well, let's say you always get your gas at Quick Trip. And let's say they accidentally debited or decreased your account by too much on a gas purchase or for an extra gas purchase. Do you really believe that you would know that? No. 
what if you had like a uh, what if you made a fifty dollar bet on the Chiefs game and somebody paid you fifty dollars and you deposited that check and they forgot to put it into your account? See, that's kind of an error of omission, isn't it? You may look and go, nothing looks weird. Well, it's not on there. You don't see it. You see what I'm saying? Now, as bad as it is to not do a bank reconciliation, a formal bank reconciliation, if you're just an individual, for a company, it is absolutely the worst thing in the world to not do. Um, I still do some accounting consulting. I've done accounting consulting for 20 years or so. And one of the first questions I ask when I go to a client is this. I say, can you please provide me and bring me out your formal bank reconciliations on all your cash accounts? because a lot of times they'll have four or five checking accounts. And the only good answer is, yes, let me get those right now, and I'll be back in two minutes. Okay? If they say, we don't do bank reconciliations, or if they say, oh, it's gonna, I, I'm going to get those to you, but it's going to be a few days, I know I'm in for a long consulting engagement, because they don't have control of their cash. To not do a bank reconciliation for a company is absolutely, you are playing with fire. Most of the fraud that I've heard about could have been prevented had the right person been doing a bank reconciliation. Okay? And you know who that person should be? If it's, the, if it's a small business, the person doing the bank rec should be the owner of the small business. It's not going to be your bookkeeper. Because if she or he or she is stealing money and they're doing the bank reconciliation, then is it providing any checks or balances? Okay. Let me tell you, I've done bank, my own bank reconciliation as an individual for 20 years or so. I have found about 15 errors over the course of those 20 years. And do you know how many of those 15 errors, how many of them do you think were in my favor and how many of them do you think were in the bank's favor. All of them, every one of the 15 were in the bank's favor. Now I'm not saying the bank is trying to rip me off. I'm just saying that they have a tendency to catch the things that are in their favor and not in mine. I'll give you some examples. One time uh, I can remember I, when I was an adjunct 15 years ago, I deposited a check in my account and I was doing my reconciliation and that deposit hadn't cleared the bank. I didn't see it in the records of the bank information. And I was like, well, what's up with that? Well, maybe I recorded it twice or maybe I forgot to deposit it. And so I looked into it and I couldn't figure out what the deal was. I called the school and said, has this check cleared? And they said, yeah, it's been, it, we, on our records, we show it's been cleared. And so I had to go to the bank and I had to have, fill out a form and they had to look into it. Well, it turns out they put that money in the wrong account. It was a $670 check. Now, if I wouldn't have done that, it would have never been caught. Because I was even late on my bank rex. It was like two months after the fact. It would not have been caught. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I don't know. Maybe you guys are richer than me, but $670 is a lot of money for me. I'll give you another example. Um, I have my checking account set up so that if I'm ever short money, it just sweeps it in from my savings account. Do you have it that way? And I know every now and then, to right before payday, I'm probably a little low and I'll, I'll do a few debit charges or write a few checks. And I'm not too worried about it because I know it, if I don't have it in checking, I got it in savings. Well, one time they, they forgot I had that and so I was doing a bank rec and I saw these $20 charges for overdrafts. So I went into the bank and I explained, you've got charges on here that are not valid. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, we they took them off. If I wouldn't have done a bank rec, I wouldn't have caught those. Okay. Kara. So does that pretty much mean you just match your checkbook to the internet yeah, bank? Yeah, I'm going I'm okay. to show you how to do that today. I'm going to show you what a bank record is like. What Kara is saying is this sounds great. Now what, what exactly are we going to do here? And I'll t teach you in a minute. Um, I went to a client of mine once and they had not done bank reconciliations, formal bank reconciliations for a year and a half. And I said, the first thing we're going to do is do our bank reconciliation. And they said, we don't need to. No, 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 no. Well, long story short is I spent about a week doing bank reconciliations. And I found a $12,000 deposit that the company had made that the bank had put in the wrong account. 
twelve thousand dollars. They didn't notice. I mean, when you're talking about companies who are dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars, a twelve thousand, you know, and I'm like, you have on your records this twelve thousand dollar deposit. It never has shown up on a checking account statement. So we looked into it. It was like five months old. I said, I hope it's not too late. Well, we went back and forth with the bank. End result is they got credit for that twelve thousand dollars. And I told my client, I said, okay, have we learned a lesson here? I said, first of all, you better not gripe about my consulting fees, because I just I just gained you twelve thousand dollars, right? But I said, let this be a lesson. If you if you are a small business owner, you listen to me at home too. If you are a small business owner and you're not doing your bank reconciliations, you are playing with fire and you're going to get burned. Just going to it's going to happen. You are going to lose money, and if people steal money, you're not using the main control that you can have to try to catch them. Okay, and just perusing online activity is not doing a bank reconciliation. Okay. Well, what is a bank reconciliation? Well, let me tell you. Okay. So you've got these. Uh, you get your bank statement like at the end of May, and the bank statement says that you have a balance of twenty-seven twenty-five ninety-two. And your, uh, your balance per your general ledger or your books is 2481.18, right? Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do this. I'm going to have to switch this. Okay, so what we're going to do to do a bank rec reconciliation is we have our balance per our bank, and then we're going to have our balance per our GL or our books, okay? And those amounts going back, I gotta look real quick. What is that? 2725.92. 2725.92. And what was our balance per book? 8118. I have to squeeze this in here. 2481.18, right? Well, what we're going to do is do a reconciliation. There are timing differences that we have to account for. There are things that are on our records that the bank doesn't know about yet. And there's things the bank has done that we don't know about until we get our statement. And once we adjust for those timing differences, we're going to hopefully come down to a balance, an adjusted balance, of a certain amount, and those amounts will be equal. You with me? That is a formal bank reconciliation. Okay? Um, let's take a look back at the PowerPoint. Now, what sort of reconciling items do we need to talk about? Well, there are things that need to be adjusted on the bank statement side or on the bank side. Okay? The things over on the left side in the yellow box, these are things that are on our record but the bank doesn't know about them yet. For instance, let's say at the very end of May, at May 31st, we did a deposit after 3 p.m. We have that on our books. That's called a deposit in transit, a deposit we've made but it does not yet show up on the book on the bank. Does that make sense? So we need to add that to the bank side. Okay, a big one is outstanding checks, right? You write a check for some, to a vendor, you deduct it from your books, you send it to the vendor, but it hasn't gone through the clearing cycle yet, so it hasn't shown up on the bank statement. It eventually is, right? That's called an outstanding check. Are you with me? an outstanding check. Well, any check that you've written and deducted from your books that doesn't show up on the bank statement is called an outstanding check and we need to deduct, deduct it from the bank statement balance. Are you with me? And then, of course, we need to look for any bank errors. Like I told you, the erroneous uh, charges that the bank was giving to my account for overdrafts when they shouldn't have done that. They should have just been sweeping money from my other account. Those are bank errors. 
Okay. Well, what about the things that we need to adjust on our side? Maybe the bank knows about these, but we don't. Those would be things on the blue side, on the right side of the screen, such as a collection by the bank. Every now and then, a business will have a bank work to collect a note receivable for them. And sometimes they don't know that that note receivable has been collected until they get the bank statement. They go like, oh, good, they collected $500 from, from uh, our customer. Well, that's something we need to add to the book side. You with me? Something else would be interest earned. You ever get your bank statement and you say, okay, oh, I earned some, money, some interest on that. Well, they've already recorded that and added it to your account. You're just finding out about it, so you need to add it to the book side. What about non-sufficient funds checks? Okay, well, let me tell you what that is. Come off the uh, PowerPoint for a second. Let's say customer, uh, let's just make up a customer, and let's say he's a real deadbeat, okay? Let's just say there's a customer named Jeff Alton, okay, and he's a real deadbeat, all right? He is, he's a friend of mine. Okay, um, so anyway, he pays me a check of $300 for services that I provided to this customer, right? And I presume that that check is going to be good. So I increase my books by $300, my general ledger, and I put the check in the bank. Well, guess what? The check balances. Or, I'm sorry, the check bounces. It's an NSF check. You see what I'm saying? So the bank says, sorry, this check from Jeff Alden did not clear. He's a total deadbeat. So what do I have to do to my books? I have to back it back out. Do you see what I'm saying? So going back to the PowerPoints, a not, an NSF check is a bounced check, and we have to deduct it from our books because it ended up not clearing. Another thing is sometimes you find out about a bank service charge when you get your statement, right? And you want, need to deduct that. Also, you could look for any book errors that you might have made, okay, transposition errors or something like that. Now. I will tell you, more and more banks are sending their bank statements electronically. Okay, now maybe I'm a little bit old school. That's fine if they want to do that. But I really encourage you to do a formal written bank reconciliation. You can do it on, on Excel if you want, but have something printed out. Like I say, when I go to a client, what I ask them to do is bring me your bank reconciliation. I don't want to hear, well, I can give those to you in two weeks, or we don't do those. No, I want a formal bank reconciliation. If they're not doing it, then they're not very knowledgeable about how to run a business. Okay? So print, if, they, if they send these to you electronically, print them out. But you want to have a document flow. You want to have a, a, a uh, evidence that this was done, correct? Let's look at an example. Um, and what you're going to find is that there's two sections to a bank reconciliation. And this is just going back to what I showed you. There's the balance per bank, which we start with and get down to an adjusted balance after taking care of those reconciling items on the bank side. And then there's the balance per books, which is different. And we have to do our reconciling items on the book side. And that gets us down to an adjusted balance. These two numbers should be equal, and when they are, you know that you did a bank reconciliation and you give yourself a Reese's peanut butter cup as your reward, okay? All right. Let's say we are going to do, to do a, a July 31 bank reconciliation statement for Simmons Company. Now, at July 31st, the bank statement says we have 96.10, but our general ledger account says we only have 74.30. Well, those are different amounts, aren't they? So we're gonna do a bank reconciliation. Now they give us this additional information. Outstanding checks total 2417. Those are checks we've written. We've reduced our general ledger by that amount, but the bank doesn't know about it yet. Okay, we also had in item two a $500 check mailed to the bank for deposit that had not yet reached the bank by the statement date. That's called a DIT, a deposit in transit. So we're gonna have to add that to the bank side. Okay, we were notified that there was a bounced check for $225. So we're going to have to deduct that from the book side, aren't we? Okay. 
Uh, it looks like we earned $30 interest during July that we're just now finding out about, so we have to add that per the book side. Okay, check number 781 for supplies expense. Cleared the bank for 268, that was the true amount, but we accidentally recorded it in our books for $240. So that's a book error. That's just we wrote something down wrong or entered it in or fat fingered it on the computer, right? And then number six, a 486 deposit by Acme Company was mistakenly credited to our account by the bank. So they put some money in our account that really shouldn't be there. Okay. Now it's kind of hard to work on this in this in this setting. Uh, if I was in a regular classroom, I would just leave this information up on the screen, and I would go to the whiteboard, and we would do this reconciliation. It's kind of hard to do because I can't show you this information and a whiteboard at the same time. So bear with me. You might might need to look at this a little carefully um, after class. Okay. But what we get to is we start with the, let me get my pointer going. We start with that bank balance of 96.10, right? And we start with our book balance of 74.30. Now, I showed you a left-right orientation, right? They're just doing it a top-bottom reconciliation. That's fine, no, no big deal, okay? All right. Well, we added that deposit in transit, didn't we? Because uh, that needed to be added to the book side. Now, what about these outstanding checks? Well, we need to subtract those, right? Because they're eventually going to be subtracted from the bank side. So this amount is really too high. We need to adjust for those outstanding checks. We also need to back off this deposit that they put in to our account that really shouldn't be there. So when we get to the end, we get a adjusted balance of 7207. Let's go down to the book side. We start with 7430. Well, we record this interest that we just found out that we earned, plus 30. Okay. We have a bounced check that we need to deduct because it didn't clear, right? And then there's a recording error, okay, of $28. Now, let's look at what that was. This is always kind of confusing for students. Let's look at item number five, okay? Check number 781 for supplies expense cleared the book for 268, but we mistakenly recorded in our books as 240. Okay, so let's come off that for a second. Here's the way I always have to do it. I always have to think through it this way. Okay, we should have reduced our books by 268. We only reduced it by 240. So we need to reduce it for the other 28. Does that make sense? Okay. So go back to the PowerPoints. So the way we adjust for that is we have to reduce it by that $28. Okay. Once we get to the end, we have an adjusted balance of $7,207. And we are happy because we've done our bank reconciliation. Okay. And it balanced to the penny. And I always liked it to balance to the penny. Number one, because I'm a little anal retentive. But number two, let's say it balances within a dollar. Well, you could have a thousand dollar error one way and a nine hundred ninety nine dollar error the other way, right? And they could just be offsetting. So I don't ever feel good unless it's to the penny. Do you see what I'm saying? But this, Kara, going back to your question earlier, does that help? What we're seeing on the screen, going back to it. That is a bank reconciliation. And that is something that you want to do manually or on the computer and print it out. And if Dave Krug or consultant or somebody else comes and asks for it, you can bring them out that with a smile and say, I do a bank reconciliation. I'm just telling you folks, if you don't do this, if you don't do this on a personal basis, you're going to lose money. The total errors I found, I've kind of kept a mental tally, was probably about $2,200 in my lifetime. Okay. For business, I can tell you that one error I found was over $10,000. It was like $12,000 or something. Okay. It was somewhere in that. I don't remember the exact amount. You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to miss things. The other thing you're going to find is this. Anna, you told me about that lady who was stealing from the company. I bet you a hundred bucks 
she was the one who did the bank reconciliation. I just bet you. She was writing herself checks or taking stuff out of the account. She would get the bank statement. And nobody was checking her work. The bank statement is your best opportunity as a business owner to check what's happening with the cash account. Okay? Just looking through online activity is, does not cut it, folks. Let's say you're a landscaping business. And let's say you see some check written to AJ, AJ Topsoil. Well, that sounds legit, doesn't it? Well, that AJ Topsoil might be a fictitious company that the bookkeeper set up and is paying money to for items that are not real services. She's made up a company. That's easy to do. I could do that in an hour. But you're just looking through it. Ah, $800 to AJ Topsoil. That looks good. I know we have that all the time. That's a fictitious company, my friends. Do you see what I'm saying? You cannot do this. Almost all of the fraud that I've been a part of, not been a part of, <laughs> not perpetrated, but either heard about, like the one you told me, Anna, or found on a client or dealt with on a consulting engagement, every time the situation was the thief was doing the bank wrecks. And if the owner would have been doing the bank wrecks, it probably would never have happened. But why didn't the, why didn't the owner do the bank wrecks? Because you trust the person, right? Just like they trusted that lady that you live next door to, Anna, right? I can just tell you over and over and over again. Okay? I just cannot tell you how many times I've seen it. So please, this is one of the few things that if you remember nothing else from my class, I want you to remember this. Do your own bank reconciliation. Have the bank statements sent to your home. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody open the mail because they, they can be altered. Okay? Have the bank statements sent to your home and always do them yourself. It doesn't take that long. Or at the very least, pay an independent outside accounting firm to do it. One of my relatives worked at a firm and he was uh, vice president of it. They lost $80,000. And sure enough, the thief was the one doing the bank reconciliations and she, she covered her tracks. She covered her tracks. She had custody of the assets and she had record keeping. I told him, I said, you could have paid an accounting firm. You could have paid me. 100 bucks a month, I'd have done them for you. You would have never lost your 80000 That company eventually had to go under because a small business, if you lose $80,000, it can be very, very difficult. Plus, they had legal fees and all this other stuff. Okay, we have a few minutes left, but one thing I want to show you is this. Look at the screen again. For, for one part of this, you have to make journal entries. Can you guess which side, the top or the bottom? You have to make journal entries for the, the book adjustments. These are, the, for these, you have to make uh, journal entries, okay? Because you're adjusting your books, okay? For those items that you just found out about. Now, so you have to do journal entries. Now, I think these shouldn't be that hard. See where interest, where we added $30? Okay, well, half the journal entries are already done because how do you increase cash? You debit it, right? So the other side of that is you're going to credit interest revenue or credit, credit interest earned. For those items that are deducted from the book balance, those are going to be items where you credit cash to reduce it. Okay? And you'll see that the journal entries are thus. Okay? Cash was increased for $30, so the other side of that journal entry is a credit to interest revenue for $30. These are items where cash was reduced, so we credited cash for $253. Here we debited supplies expense for the other $28, which we should have done originally. And we also reestablished that deadbeat customers $225. We, re we decreased that accounts receivable because we thought they'd paid, right? But the check bounced, right? So we have to debit or increase that accounts receivable. So these are the JEs for a, that bank reconciliation. Does that make sense? And then, of course, once you make these adjusting journal entries, then your adjusted balance will, in, on your books, will equal that 7207 
that you saw as the adjusted book balance on your bank rec. All right? See that 7207? We'll go back to the bank rec real quick. See it right here? It's right here, down here. And also, another thing, when you do your bank rec, title it up. Name of the company, what you're doing, the date. Okay, don't just scratch it on the back of a gum wrapper or a post-it note and stick it in a file. No, prepare it as a formal document that can be reviewed. Okay? When people don't do that, it makes me really nervous as a consultant. Okay? Okay, that is it for bank recs. Okay, but we're going to be working on some. Um, and I want you to work on these as homework. And I want you to do these formally. Don't just, you're not just making calculations. You're performing a bank reconciliation. Do you understand the difference? Okay. All right. Let me see what I want you all to do. And then I'll let you run along. Okay. Uh, for homework, let's go ahead and do... Quick study 8.6 and exercise 8.9 and 8.10. So there's your homework assignment, okay? I want you to do those. I want you to do those to the best of your ability, okay? Those won't be the only bank recs that we do, but let's have you do those. We'll go over the answers together. And then I'll give you some ones that are maybe a little harder. Okay, bye-bye, guys.